Hello and welcome. I'm Hamai Okan, and here's what happened this week. Taiwan's semiconductor giant, TSMC, says it will start mass producing two nanometer technology by 2025. The company made the announcement Wednesday at its North America Technology Convention in California. The 2 nanometer chip is said to be 15% faster than the N3E 3 nanometer generation, which will enter mass production later this year. TSMC is fighting to stay ahead of its rivals. Intel plans to produce 2 nanometer chips in 2024 and Samsung in 2025. Taiwan's largest annual religious event is wrapping up. The Dajiamatsu procession draws hundreds of thousands of people each year, and this is the first pilgrimage in three years without COVID restrictions. Our reporter Yvonne Young went to central Taiwan to learn more about some of the unique features of the event. This is the Dajiamatsu procession, Taiwan's biggest religious celebration. Hundreds of thousands of worshippers have come out this year to mark the sea goddess Mazu's birthday. They will accompany her as she is carried around 340 kilometers through central Taiwan. The organizers released Mazu's nine-day schedule before the pilgrimage began, so people could join in at any point during the parade. I'm at the Yonghe Temple in the central city of Taichung, waiting for the procession to arrive. The pilgrimage is a religious tradition that dates back hundreds of years, but now it's evolving with the times. Almost everyone has a smartphone. You can check Mazu's current location on the Daja Mazu app. But Mazu didn't show up on time this year. She was held up for hours thanks to huge crowds of worshippers. Now that Taiwan's COVID restrictions have been lifted, Everyone wants to get in on the tradition that was banned last year, crouching under Mazu's Satan chair as he passes, praying for good fortune in the coming year. To join the procession, you'll need to plan ahead. Some block, a good pair of shoes, and other personal items are recommended. But one thing you'll never have to worry about is food. Devotees provide snacks and drinks all along the route. It's almost like an all-you-can-eat buffet. For them, this is a way to pitch in and make friends. And there's also some local history behind their generosity. Along the route, local families place their home altars at the door, waiting for Mazu to pass by. How do they know when she's approaching? That's the role of the Bobeya. That's the person who runs at the head of the parade. The Bobeya beats a gong, letting people know the goddess is almost there. Every part of the Bobeya's outfit from top to bottom has its own meaning. For instance, they only wear one shoe throughout the event. The long shoe symbolizes sacrifice, while the foot that's bare connects them to the earth. Like other roles in the procession, people serve as the bobeya in shifts. Two have been selected this year, meaning they have to walk on one bare foot for hours. It's no easy task, but doing it in the name of Mazu makes it all worthwhile. The Dajia Mazu procession is so big, it's known well outside of Taiwan. The Discovery Channel has named it one of the top three religious festivals in the world. And now that Taiwan has fully reopened to the world, this event could start drawing new participants from near and far. Tamashi, Maggie Mei, and Yvonne Yang for Taiwan Plus. The number of black-faced spoonbills wintering in Taiwan has hit a record high. 4,200 of the migratory birds have been seen this winter. That's up 400 from the year before. The figure represents about two-thirds of the endangered species' estimated population. The birds were much harder to track this year because of drought conditions in the south of the country forced them to disperse over a wider area. Several foreign powers have had control in Taiwan over its history. The Dutch, the Chinese, and the Japanese all had their impact on the island nation. Yet some are remembered more kindly than others. Bing Wang finds out why. This is the presidential office of Taiwan in the heart of the capital, Taipei. It's where the president and vice president work and where foreign delegations meet with high-level Taiwanese officials. 
The building was completed in 1919 by Japanese architect Yuheji Nagano during the 50-year period of Japanese rule of Taiwan. It all started with the uh, Japanese occupation era, which started in 1895. Uh, this presidential palace, when it began, it used to be a smaller scale residential property, and then over the years became the presidential palace. The Japanese ruled Taiwan until 1945, when they were forced to give it up after losing World War II. Initial Japanese rule uh, involved ruling over Taiwanese subjects who didn't want to be ruled by the Japanese. So this is the, the first uh, decade or two following 1895. There were a large number of revolts and insurrections against Japanese rule that were violently put down by the Japanese military. By the third decade, the Japanese had built schools, hospitals, and developed infrastructure, beneficial vestiges that are still used today. This is Chidong Street, right in the capital of Taipei. It serves as a reminder of Japanese colonial rule over Taiwan, where these houses used to host civil servants and high-level officials from Japan. But the Japanese also left their mark in other ways, from the food Taiwanese people eat and the sports that are played. The Taiwanese is deeply, profoundly influenced by the Japanese. The, the entire culture, not just the architecture, the city planning, the artwork, the history, all of the artistic treasures uh, in the daily life are, are mainly like that. But in 1949, a few years after World War II, Taiwan was flooded by some two million people from China. They were led by Chiang Kai-shek of the Kuomintang, or KMT, who lost the Chinese Civil War to the Communist Party. Thus began a 40-year period of oppressive rule known as the White Terror, when the KMT jailed dissidents and imposed Chinese culture and the Mandarin language. Chiang Kai-shek's rule firsthand, and many of them have uh, obviously very negative experiences living under the White Terror, living under a very brutal authoritarian regime. Um, many, I should say, much fewer people have experienced Japanese rule firsthand. These days, government statistics show 60% of Taiwanese see Japan in a favorable light, and only 35% feel similarly inclined towards China. Taiwan is still working to reconcile its painful history, balancing nostalgia for its colonial Japanese past, with the wounds inflicted by more recent oppressors. The Kanti is still a presence in Taiwanese society, and while debate rages over maintaining the monuments to its brutal legacy, there are fewer questions here about keeping the landmarks left by the Japanese. Andy Shi and Bing Wong for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan is on the verge of becoming a super-aged society. That means that soon 20% of the country's people will be older than 65. One neighborhood chief in Taipei is helping seniors keep up with the times. Joy Sung reports. These Taiwanese seniors are learning how to use a chatbot. It's a free class offered by a Taipei neighborhood chief for anyone in his community over 60 years old. Classes like these are regularly offered here to teach older community members new skills and help them stay self-sufficient. Even the neighborhood chief himself is sitting in. There are also more physical activities, like this one involving a stress ball. So what does AI and this exercise ball have in common? Not much, but this class in Taipei are putting them together to exercise the minds and bodies of these elders. According to the National Development Council, by 2025, Taiwan will be a super-aged society. That means soon one in every five people will be over 65. Like its East Asian neighbors, Japan and South Korea, birth rates here are critically low and life expectancy is only getting higher. With the ratio of dependents to the working population also on the rise, Taiwanese officials want to provide more resources for the country's seniors. And for this community in Taipei, Chatbot 101 is just the first step. To make the tech less daunting, the volunteer teacher says he humanizes the process, telling students to chat with the bot as they would a friend, but in simple language that even a child would understand. <laughs> and as answers loaded, the teacher told the seniors to give the bot a moment to think. He's found it an effective strategy.
。ChatGPT 有你想象的难吗？还是不会，很简单。<笑>你问他什么，他都可以跟你回答。我觉得非常方便。For these seniors, learning how to talk to a chatbot is a way to help them stay in the know. And classes like these also help seniors keep their fitness and spirits up, encouraging them to learn more about the changing world together. Andy Shui and Joyce Zhen for Taiwan Plus. There are currently around 60,000 visually impaired people in Taiwan, but there are only 33 working guide dogs in the entire country. These numbers fall far short of international standards, and it's an issue that's been going on for years. Sandy Chi has this story. This is Yumi. She's not like other dogs that you might see on the streets. You should not pet her or play with her, as she is busy concentrating looking after her owner, Vito Lee. Vito is visually impaired. He relies on Yumi a professionally trained guide dog to get around. She's been guiding Vito for three years now. Over that time, the pair have formed an inseparable bond. Like Vito and Yumi, a guide dog's companionship and support can be life-changing for people with visual disabilities. There are over 60,000 visually impaired people living in Taiwan. But according to the latest statistics, the country only has 33 working guide dogs. And this number has barely changed in half a decade. The Ministry of Health and Welfare says the country needs at least 600 trained guide dogs to come anywhere close to meeting international standards. It takes two to three years to fully train a guide dog and costs over $32,000 each. It's not just high cost. The reasons behind the shortage are complex. Sunny Huang has been a guide dog trainer for eight years. She says that training more working dogs would be a huge undertaking. Training a guide dog is a lot of time to train. It's not the same as our ability. We don't have the volume. The volume is not the same as the volume. It's a lot of time to make the volume. It's a lot of time to make the volume. It's a lot of time to make the volume. This guide dog shortage also hints at wider societal issues. Compared with other countries, Taiwan is considered less accommodating for visually impaired people. I Taiwan in addition to confusing infrastructure and street layouts, the process for applying for a guide dog can be a daunting and difficult experience. Having a dog might also affect visually impaired people's ability to find work or look for accommodation. Vito is lucky to have Yumi here to help him. But he's just one of many visually impaired people in Taiwan. And unless there are major changes in the current process, Tens of thousands of others will never know how life-changing the aid and companionship of a guide dog can be. Asnaya Zhou and Sandy Chi for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching. Here's what happened. Finally today, we leave you with the images of those black-faced spoonbills here in Taiwan. I'm Hamio Khan. Take care and see you next week.